This is Bishop Gregory Brewer's part two of a two-night teaching series at the Healing Ministry at All Saints Episcopal Church, Winter Park, Florida, January 15th, 2014. Here's what I thought I would do in terms of, first of all, if you're a teacher, good teaching, as some of you know, is sort of like, I'm going to tell you what I'm going to tell you, and then I'm going to tell you, and then I'm going to tell you what I told you. And so what I want to do is do the first part right away, just in terms of giving you a layout, what we're going to do over the course of the evening together. First thing we're going to do is that we're going to pray, and the reason we're going to pray is that unless God shows up, I'm just sunk. <laughs> and, uh, and really praying, and if you were here last night, how many of you were here last night? Oh, quite a few. You will remember we actually did this last night as well. Asking God to craft what it is that He would like to say in our midst. And believe me, that is in no way pro forma for me. Uh, there is absolutely no way under heaven except God grant it that no matter what kind of study and prep I do, I will say something that will actually be meaningful to you. There is a gap, you see, and it's true for all of us fellow humans, that between what it is that I experience on the inside and both what you perceive of me on the outside, and much less an ability to be able to communicate that allows a flow back and forth, and that's only compounded when there's no coming back this way, instead I'm just standing up and talking. So I really am asking, and we will ask together for the Lord to really organize the evening, and hopefully through our time together, there'll be something that's said that will actually come home in a way that is meaningful. So I'm, I'm really asking the Lord to do that, so we are going to do that. The second thing that we're going to do is that we are going to sing uh, you gave me the chorus, thank you. Lord, prepare me to be a sanctuary. I think most people know that which of course. And we're going to sing it a couple of times. I'm going to go sit down and get that down. And then I'm going to come back. And then what I will do is tell a couple of brief stories about how I got into all this stuff. Um, it's not in most seminary curriculums, I assure you. But that's only because seminary education is at a deficit when it comes to this ministry, not because it's unimportant. So I want to say a couple of things about how I wound up getting in, because quite honestly, most people who are involved in the healing ministry are in the healing ministry because they have needed and continually need to be healed. Um, and so I'm going to talk a little bit about that. Then I will do a brief recap of some of the key points that I made last night and tease them out a little bit more, because a lot was said last night. There were several sort of key points. So I want to tease those out a little bit. And then the last thing that I want to do is to hear from you. And what I mean by that is this. It's not going to be Q&A as in you ask a question and I answer it, and then you ask the question. What I'm instead going to say is, okay, given the things that I've said thus far this evening, are there things that you would like to know more about or have a particular question? And, then, and what I'm going to do actually is maybe get about five across the room. Because usually those questions can actually form uh, a way of responding that might hit what it is that you're asking. Um, usually it's one question isn't sufficient to get that sense, but several are. So I'll do that. And then once I'm done, we will actually create, I'm going to turn things over to Don and Father Rob, and there'll be an opportunity for her ministry, there'll be teams and corners and things like that. So that's sort of the layout. So the introduction that I just gave, prayer, a couple of stories, recap, Q&A, ministry. Okay? Are we together? All right. First part, prayer. Please stand. Now remember the prayer. This is a covenant that we're asking God together to, as we gather together in His name, that He would be the one to lead the evening and that through your questions, the things that I have to say, or through something that just actually may even pop in your head that has nothing to do with anything that I'm talking about, God might say something that would be meaningful. Because I count on that. So, the Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. 
Gracious Lord, we gather together this evening in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. We open our hearts and our minds to his presence. Thank you for this opportunity that brings us together for the people who work to make it possible for the food and for the prayers, the organization. We are already more the beneficiaries of a lot of generosity. And we are extremely grateful to you and to them, Lord. We pray that that would only continue, that we would turn the focus of our hearts to you, and you, out of your great generosity, would open us up to that which you desire to say. For we confess to you, Lord, that we cannot grasp it unless you reveal it and enable us to understand what it is that you are revealing. So, O oh Lord, I pray that you would take my words, give me words. Allow us, over the course of this evening, to hear from you. Communicate to us, O oh Lord, that which you desire. And so we say, speak, Lord, your servants are listening. We yield to you, and we ask to be led. For it is in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, that we pray. Amen. Amen. Do you all know the little, no, sit down. Do you all know the little worship chorus? Lord, prepare me to be a sanctuary. Pure and holy, tried and true, with thanksgiving, I'll be a living sanctuary for you. Okay, let's do the prayer. But please don't turn off your prayer mind. That as we're singing this, I pray that you would continue to make that something that you're saying not just to us, but really to God, because that's the, that's the point of the lyrics, okay?
I was entirely unprepared for anything like this, except the kind of dry, arid spirituality that I knew that made no room to speak of for any kind of present experience of the supernatural left me as a middle school student profoundly hungry. I didn't know what to do with it, but I just had this sense, where did it come from? I had no idea that there was more to life than that which you could see, touch, taste, and smell. There was one avenue that pointed in that direction, and it had nothing to do with the church. It was actually horror movies. <laughs> they talked a lot about supernatural, and believed in it, and I was absolutely captivated by the things that I watched. And so what that led me into was a whole series of experiences, sometimes quite spiritually powerful, uh, in the occult. I tried all kinds of things. And the more I could get deep, the more deeply I got into it, the more I knew that I was actually touching on something that was real. Not only was it real, it was actually quite exciting and a little bit scary, which actually made it all the more exciting. I mean, a lot of people who wind up getting involved in occult behavior are actually quite adventurous people. And I like risks. Ask my wife. I'll take a risk in a heartbeat. And this was one of those situations. So I jumped in. Again, there was nothing else in my church experience or in my home life that would in any way somehow invite me into this except for its dryness. Well, it was in the midst of all of that, that through a whole series of circumstances that I won't go, I won't go into, at least tonight, um, I got invited to a retreat. It was interdenominational. It was openly charismatic. It took place at an Episcopal retreat center in Richmond, Virginia, called Rosalind, which is why I grew up was in Richmond. And over the course of that weekend, I came as a full and complete skeptic. But something happened. I saw a woman be prayed for, and she got up out of the wheelchair, right in front of me. And you see, because of my experience and involvement in the occult, while I was startled, I, that was all. I was shocked. In fact, at one level, it made perfect sense, because I knew enough about the, the wicked and the divine that you could, in fact, actually curse someone and it could result in his wellness. And if the Christian understanding of God is that Jesus triumphed over the principalities and powers, in fact, a lot of the stories in the Gospels where Jesus brings healing has everything to do with casting out of an evil spirit and a person feeling better or being made whole. I thought, sure. If you could curse and someone would get sick, and if Jesus is who he says he is, then he can bring healing and break the curse. I mean, to me, it was, it was profoundly logical, actually. And out of that weekend, through, again, a whole series of events, I wanted to personally say yes to Christ and was a dramatically Jewish person. <laughs> I went back to my university campus and literally had to change crowds. Um, the girl with whom I was dating and I broke up um, it was a breach. I felt kind of in the breach because, quite honestly, the Christians I met, I didn't really like at all. Um, <laughs> but I knew that I couldn't continue what I had been doing and that Christ had, in fact, been real in my life. It wasn't too long after that that I really began to be intrigued by prayer ministry and healing. I'd already seen it happen. And I was, so I showed up at a healing service. And I went forward for prayer. And I guess I had some vestiges of the old occult stuff in me. Because when this dear woman prayed for me, laid her hands on my head, I felt an entity just walk right out of my body. Mm -hmm. And I 
mean, it wasn't sort of visibly dramatic in any way, but I, I felt this thing leave. And as a result, there was in fact a market difference in my life. And I thought, wow, I think I want to do this. And I started reading. Now, at that point, we're talking 35 years ago. Who did you read? You had Agnes Sandbrooks, who some of you might know. Her books are still has um, currency to them. Uh, an active Episcopalian and pioneer in the healing ministry for a lot of people. So I read Agnes Sanford and later Francis of God and all these people. And, and slowly but surely, two things began to happen to me. One, I began to pray for people. And sometimes, to my utter astonishment, things happened. I saw people get healed. Not all the time. In fact, if anybody tells you that they've got a thousand in the healing ministry, they're not telling you the truth. There is a kind of episodic nature to healing miracles that defies regularity and explanation. If anybody can tell you why it doesn't always happen, run the other way. It's very easy, and in fact, it is a temptation for humans to develop a system that tries to explain all of the unanswered. But we have not been given that by God. We'll know eventually. What does Paul say in 1 Corinthians 13? Then, talking about us being in the presence, in the presence of the visible presence of Christ on the other side of the grave, then I shall know even also as I have known. But on this side of the grave, as Paul says, we know what in part. That means we don't have all the picture. And as much as we would like to be godlike and not live with uncertainty and, un and answers that don't always seem to make sense, that's just our lot. And I think in some ways that's a part of the design of God because the very thing that God would not want to give us is mastery that makes healing ministry technique because that in and of itself is the very substance of what a cult practice is. It's about the mastery of a spiritual system so that you, by the techniques that are given to you by spiritual masters, can control that power for your own end. That's what a cult power and all of it is all about. And so any temptation to make the healing ministry fit into that mold where it becomes a series of steps that if you master then X plus Y equals Z, and that means healing and answered prayer, I mean, God isn't involved in that. I, I used to think that that's what it was. There was a fellow I saw at one point. The way he prayed for people just blew me out of the water. And I mean healing after healing after healing. And I noticed something. I, I, I always prayed in the name of Jesus, amen. But I noticed this man, Pentecostal as he was, he always prayed in Jesus' name. And I thought, that must be it. <laughs> I just need to change the emphasis on the right, on the right word, and that will not unlock her ministry for me. And of course I tried, and God laughed, and finally I did too. All of us have this profoundly human desire to master power. It's one of the great attributes that is both liable for demagoguery and idolatry, as well as for great good, to try to master something. It's a part of who we are. But if we apply that discipline to the spiritual life, we're going to be just in the very wrong place. Because to grow in the spiritual life is, in fact, counterintuitive to that desire. Instead, it's all about being willing to be led, not leading. It's about yielding, not mastery. It's not about technique. It's actually about an admission of ignorance. And in fact, my sense is the more I am willing to come into that place of weakness, the more open I, in fact, can become to God choosing to do something through me that would be above and beyond, as the scripture says, anything I could ever ask or imagine. 
But if I'm somehow trying to make it happen through a set of spiritual techniques, God is gracious that he occasionally actually honors that. But it's not his long-term plan. And in the end, what we end up with is an idolatry of the technique. Rather than a living relationship with a God who communicates with us and through that tells us what to do and how to pray. In other words, you can't divorce healing ministry from relationship. Healing ministry without relationship is a cult technique. But it's not just relationship. It's relationship that allows us to be a vessel. In fact, Rob and I were having this conversation over, over dinner. I, I said to him, for me, the, the definition of Christian maturity is when a transition takes place inside of a believer where he or she no longer pursues God primarily for his or her own well-being, but instead pursues God primarily that he or she might be a vessel to serve others. And the more I'm willing to enter into that, Lord, prepare me to be a sanctuary, a vessel that God uses, that's when things begin to open up. In both, even in my relationship with God, and I begin to learn things I would have never, ever been open to receive or even begun to comprehend had it just been about me trying to get myself better. Sure, that's kind of where many of us start. Because we're broken people. We live with tremendous hurts and anxieties. Life is not fun as much as we want to always communicate that to other people. And there are places in our hearts that sometimes we show others, and sometimes we don't, and, and it's not all, all that easy. <laughs> but if it's all about me somehow trying to get better and get fixed, and I never get past that, I'm basically in the spiritual world still very much a, not a childlike Christian, because a childlike Christian is willing to be led, but a childish Christian that continues to need to be fed. Be the difference between being led and being fed. See, it's not mastery. It's relinquishment. It's Lord, the Franciscan prayer. Lord, make me an instrument of your peace. Where there is hatred, let me so love. Where there is injury, pardon. Where there is doubt, faith, despair, hope. All of those phrases are the prayers of one who has given him or herself over to be a vessel that God uses to make a difference in the lives of other people. And that is the very essence of healing ministry. That's it. And the more I'm willing to enter into that, the more I begin to discover the prizes of what God uses me. So when that's how I kind of got into it. And what began to happen was the more I began into it, 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 it became like a cycle because I'd see God do some things in people that would cause me to ask all kinds of questions. Sometimes for the questions about how did that happen because it was extraordinary. And other times were, well, why didn't that happen? Because the prayer didn't go the way I expected. And they didn't feel any better. You know, it is a kind of question. Is that you're praying and you're asking God and you're moving and you're mom. Well, how are you doing? <laughs> well, I really don't feel a thing. How many of that happened? Come on. I'm going to ask you. That's, that's actually sort of normal. That's not abnormal. As I said, none of us bad house. And, and so all of those would drive me back to God. Okay, Lord, what do I need to learn? Or what needs to change in my life? Or how can I allow that flow to be easier than it was? And therefore, God begins to open up new places in me where I need to be healed, where I need to be changed. New disciplines that I need to put in my life. Because we're all, you see, in Jesus are being changed. We are being changed. It's not just a question of, I once was lost, but now I'm found, although that can happen. But the real sense of what it means to be a Christian is that it is an ongoing, I am being changed in this life. I never get out of this mode of, except you become as a little child, you'll never enter the kingdom of heaven. 
I always need to be take a hint of my Heavenly Father who I'm learning more and more to trust. It used to be that way. I didn't trust God at all. I didn't trust anybody except for me. To allow myself to be led into the traffic of human existence and trust that He will see me through. Even though sometimes that happens at a great price. That was one of the points that I made last night that, some, that to enter into this ministry, in fact, can require deep suffering. Suffering because of the pain that you feel from others. Suffering from the anguish that you enter into when things don't work out the way you want. I mean, it was no one less than Teresa of Avila who said famously, Lord, if this is how you treat your friends, it's no wonder that you have so few of them. <laughs> and it can be like that at times. That doesn't mean that God doesn't love you. I mean, there's that wish you weren't, it wasn't in the Bible passage in Hebrews about the Lord chastening those who he loves. But it's in there just like the rest of it. And so that, that in fact happens. And I still know within my deep part of hearts that there are parts of me that are broken. I, I am not all together. I still am very much a man who is being healed. And I have the sense that that will probably be true until I am finally shedding the physical body. I am changed into his likeness. E even when I get nervous when people are real definitive about a lot of things, I have to tell you, I'm 62 years of age. The more I know, the more I realize I don't know. And while there are things where the scripture is profoundly clear, and to deviate from them is, in fact, to depart from Jesus. There are other things that are not clear. And I'm willing for it to be okay, for it to be not clear. Again, it is the human temptation to create an airtight system. And so you, you have to be willing to live with the nebulous. And that's, that's just not always easy. But it is the way that it has been given to us. But I know that the more I give myself to him, the more I make room in my life for the people he sends my way, whether I have any natural affinity to them or not, the more God begins to show up and move. You remember last time, and I'm going to stop. You remember last night, the gospel reading was the story of Zacchaeus. And the last line was, the son of man came to see and say that which was lost. Look at Zacchaeus. If, 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 if the CEOs of the world wanted to develop a plan to how to win that part of Palestine for Jesus, they would not have picked Zacchaeus as the guy who would be hosting him for dinner that night. Because Zacchaeus was an outcast. He was a traitor to the nation of Israel because he collaborated with the Romans around the paying of taxes. Nobody liked Zacchaeus. And yet it was to Zacchaeus that he said, I've got to stay in your house. And it changed his life. I'm going to give away half of everything I own. And if I defraud the poor, I'm going to give them back four times as much. And what does Jesus say? Today, salvation has come. Knowing that Jesus came to Zacchaeus, first of all says to me that God really cares about the outcast parts of me. And that there is no part of me that is not welcomed into the presence of God. As broken as it might be, I am still entirely accepted in Christ Jesus. In fact, I want to say to you, the more I grow to know him, the more amazing he is. Far beyond anything I could ever ask or imagine. But I also know that because it's the Zacchaeuses that have God's heart. And that they often are the keys to spiritual revival in a community. That God uses those relationships again and again. It's to the Zacchaeuses that I am drawn. The people who feel like they're broken and they don't fit in. The people who are the ones who sort of hang around on the outside waiting for somebody to ask them to dance. Or to get them picked on the team in sports. I know what that's like. And the more I connect with people like that, and it happens a lot, the more I discover about the heart of Jesus. And the more healing happens. 
but through as well as in, because the Son of Man came to seek and save that which was lost. I did not come to call the righteous, Jesus says, but who? Sinners. And in that context, that meant people who were on the outside, not the ones on the outside. So, that's teasing out a little bit of what I had to say last night. I want to read you one quote, and then we'll take some questions. This is from a book called Compassion, uh, but that includes the author, Ari Nowen, but a couple of others as well. And this is a quote. It is not said of Jesus that he reached down from on high to pull us up from slavery until he first became a slave with us. God's compassion is a compassion that reveals itself in servanthood. Jesus became subject to the same powers and influences that dominate us and suffered our fears, uncertainties, and anxieties with us. Jesus emptied himself. He gave up a privileged position, a position of majesty and power, and assumed fully and without reservation a condition of total dependency. If you want to be in the healing ministry, the same invitation applies. An invitation to be willing to be led, to give up certainty, to give up control, to learn how to listen to the voice of your Heavenly Father. And that can be hard work at times, and other times it's just fun. And in so doing, be changed and to be a vessel for change. Sometimes in individuals, sometimes in communities, sometimes in cities. Healing is much more than the restoration of an individual. The goal is that the earth might be filled with the waters of God, as the, with the glory of God as the waters cover the sea. And that many people I know who are gifted in the area of healing walk and pray for their community, particularly in times of community violence and discord. You, some of you know that I was involved in some of the things around the Trayvon Martin and, uh, occurrence, and one of the things that delighted me is that how some of the Christians in those communities began to pray and walk the streets of Sanford, people who are filled with compassion. They did not want to see that city erupt into violence, and it could have. Very, very easily. And there were plenty of people that would have liked to have seen that happen because that would have given them a platform on, through which to address the nation. They didn't want to do that. And so, but it was those people who interceded and prayed who saw this as a call of attention from the Holy Spirit. It, is, it really is social. It's not just individual. But that's where it started. And different gifts of healing, as Paul says in 1 Corinthians, gifts, plural, often branch out into those kinds of directions. So that some people have some real gifts in the area of deliverance. Others have real specialties in working with the emotionally wounded. Others are gifted in the area of physical restoration. Others pray and intercede for the healing necessary in a broken community. Others go before God for the healing of nations. All of that is the healing ministry of Jesus. Because his goal is the earth shall be filled with the glory of God. Not just you and I getting a little better. So it's a broad, broad invitation to take your place in this gift that God has given his church that the world might be a better kind of place. And that we might be as vessels and have the joy of getting in on what God is doing in the earth. That's how I think about it. God, how did you let me into this? I love it. So even though the price is high, I'd rather do this than anything else. Questions? Yes. Excuse me. Yes. Excuse me. Yes. Excuse me. Just a minute. Well, wait, wait. I want to make sure I get a question. Yes, but what we want to do with this is set this question on the mic. So oh, I know. I'm prepared. Go ahead. Your question? Uh, yeah, I have a question. Uh, I'm not going to say you're righteous, but that was the law. We 
we always hear everyone is lost, everyone is a sinner. Would you tell me if my name is Cooper saying this correctly? I did not come to say the righteous of that which is lost. I think he was talking about Israel. He came to save the lost people, the Jews. Okay, is that your question? Because what I want to do is get a list, remember? She's asking me to spend a little bit more time on the verse, I did not come with all the righteous but sinners, and trying to identify who those people are, especially. And are they the Jews? Is that what you said? Uh, I wonder if you came to save the Jewish people. And, and then I have to say about I did not come to say the righteous. Well, we are told that no one is righteous. Quite right. That's all sinners, so I have a, a problem with that. Okay, very good. Another question. Really? <laughs> this will be quick. Do you want The difference between pity and compassion. The difference between pity and compassion. Okay? Yes. Being called in to the church where the righteous didn't want to want them as a king. Okay, here's the question. Her question is you know, similar to her question. Okay, Zacchaeus was lost, and then he becomes righteous. Then what then, given the fact that he was an outcast? Is that a fair assessment? Okay. I want to make sure I'm being accurate. Okay, let's deal with these three and then see where we go. In some ways, the Zacchaeus story is a perfect analogy to Jesus' statement about not coming to call the righteous sinners. What he's trying to do in some ways is poke at Pharisaic leaders who think that they are in fact righteous before God because they adhere to a certain law system. I would like to finish before you give me a follow-up, if I may. And, and you see, what Jesus is trying to point out is the fact that we really are broken sinners, all of us, no matter who we are. That's why when John the Baptist saw Jesus approaching him, he said, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. That's pretty comprehensive, isn't it? In other words, that's all of us. And that yes, while Israel played a very clear role in revealing the righteous law of God and the covenants that God made with Israel. In the time of Jesus, something new is broken forth that really invites all people everywhere, no matter who they are, to come and see Him. So, in that sense, not, call, not calling the righteous, well, at one level, that's all of us, except for those people who are of the mistaken notion that they really are okay inside. And instead, sinners, and that's who we are, yeah, all of us, because, which is why every single Sunday, let us confess our sins against God in our neighbor. Now, the question about pity and compassion, I tell you, let me do yours, and then I'll do yours about uh, pity and compassion. The, Zacchaeus, we don't know what happened to Zacchaeus, actually. Was he restored to the community of Israel after being an outcast? Who knows? They, the community might have taken the counsel of their traveling rabbi, Jesus, and restored him, as it were, into the fellowship of the local synagogue. Because they would have considered him an outcast because of his collaboration with the Romans. You don't do that with Gentiles under the same Jewish law. But for us, as the readers of the story, well, that's a much wider audience. You see, the point of the story is to us is there are going to be a lot of people, and maybe we were some, who in coming to Christ let go of really heinous behavior. And it is the challenge of the community, the Christian community, to accept and receive people, even though they have extraordinarily checkered pasts, and to give them the freedom to discover the newness of what it means to be living in Jesus. Because we live in communities with very, very long memories, right? Especially if people have lived in a community for generations and they tell stories about their grandparents and things. It's, it's very hard in a community like that to, to, in essence, take a new step forward without being reminded, even if it's never to your face, of 
about what you used to do and where you used to go and who you used to sort of do bad things with. And so in many ways, the message of Zacchaeus to us as a church is to really, number one, believe that people can be transformed by the power of Jesus. And when it begins to happen, to really call for it and to accept willingly into our fellowship those people who have experienced that kind of change. It doesn't mean we're not being smart, but it does mean we're willing to give people the gracious invitation to come and be a part of us to see how we might serve God together even though we may not have approved of their past at all. Pity and compassion. Pity means, I feel sorry. I, I actually really hurt for what it is that you're going through. I'm just really sorry. That's pity. Compassion is, I can't get it out of my way, but it is that you're going through. And I want to find a way to do something about it. You see, the scripture says that Jesus was, and this is intentional, Jesus was moved with compassion and healed their sick. In other words, compassion is love in action. Compassion does. It, it's more than just feeling. It actually engages. It does whatever it can to try to make a difference. In other words, it is that which God builds into us that motivates us to do something about what's going on, rather than merely sitting back and feeling badly about it. If all I do is sit around and feel badly, that's better than being cynical. But it doesn't necessarily move you into action. Compassion just doesn't let you go. You've got to do something. And that's what we see in Jesus. He was moved with compassion, and therefore he healed their sick. Yes. You mentioned trying to feel some or trying to channel uh, energy and feel someone and not being effective. And I'm wondering And not being what I'm sorry. Not being effective, not getting the result you were praying right. for. Right. Praying for people and sometimes it doesn't work out the way you So my question is, do you feel that it's you know, your time spent was wasted and nothing happened? Do you feel that something's happening on a level that you just are not aware of? How do you read, if I can summarize it, please correct me if I'm wrong. How do you read a situation when there seems to be no visible change? Is that fair? Okay. Um, when you break yourself you know, I, <clears throat> well, first of all, I believe that if you pray in the name of Christ, then something really does transform. No matter whether a person is conscious of it or not. That doesn't mean the symptoms have changed. Sometimes they don't. But that doesn't mean something that has something hasn't been affected in here. So do I feel like it is time wasted? In fact, absolutely not. And, and in fact, here's the thing. Um, I was last week, was it last week, the Trinity, uh, up at Trinity School for Ministry. And I was up there actually taking a class on submissions. That's where my brain is going these days. What does it mean to be a missionary bishop? And, but it was a healing service on Wednesday night, and a very wonderfully gifted woman by the name of Sharon Lewis, who's an ordained Episcopal clergy person from the Tampa area, was up there, and she and I conducted a healing service together. And we prayed for a lot of people that night. And it was so tender. Oh, I was so wonderful. And there was somebody she particularly wanted, she and I together to pray for. So it was pretty much finished, most people had left. And so she and I sat down with a couple of other people and we prayed for this young man. And he just looked at us like we were nuts. And Sherry leaned over because she knew him. I was the stranger. Well, how are you doing? And so, at that point, I think, okay, God, what do I do? Well, she had a relationship. So, I, I just, just continued to stay there for a little while with my hand on his arm, just pray quietly as she talked with him. And then after a while, I, I got up and I walked away, actually wanted to get involved with a couple of other people over here. 
He had two reactions in the next 24 hours. The first reaction was he got really angry. I got prayed for and nothing happened. Where's God in that? Fair question. And then within a matter of, well, that was like before he went to bed that night. And then the next morning, he thought, I need to talk to somebody. In other words, he was stirred up inside in a way that was very emotionally different from me. Yeah, I guess if you want to pray for me, that's okay. And the result being, he's actually moving into a position of discipleship. Now, if all I had known was his reaction in front of me, I heard the second hand the next day. Then I would say, well, God, you know, I gave it my best shot. Uh, he's your son, and you love him more than I do. Uh, may or will be accomplished in his life. And that's it. And sometimes that's all you've got. In fact, sometimes it's worse. Sometimes you agonize, you fight, you pray, you fast, and they die anyway. And you are left feeling absolutely bereft. And you have to give it to God and keep going. And that is not easy. But it is that to which we are called. And the glory of it, if the person is a Christian, is that you know that when they finally pass over and that cancerous dead body is finally no longer a part of their existence, they're completely and totally healed in a way that none of us know in this life. You know, they're dancing and singing at that point. But it's still hard and really beautiful. And as I can, I, I, I can't offer explanations for all of that. But I do know that the scripture is really clear that to give in the name of Jesus always does something in, in the realm of the kingdom. Even though I don't always see what that is. So but here, and here's the point. If you're trying to think, well, do I pray or not around, well, is it going to be successful or not? That becomes a personal master issue. You can't hedge your bets. The call is to go for broke. Give, and it shall be given to you, pressed down, shaken together, money over. Uh, and if it's all about you wanting to look good and be impressive and tell great stories about how people were healed, so that you'll think better of me, then you're in the wrong ballpark. That's not what this is about. It's not at all about trying to be impressive. And that's a weapon that the enemy uses among people who like to brag about how God has answered their prayers. <laughs> I mean, I can tell you some stories about people getting up out of wheelchairs. But, and, they really, and that really does happen. I want to say that really does happen. I've seen it. I've prayed for people. It's occurred. But if that's all you know, then you don't have the whole story. So I want to give you the whole story. But the wonder of the miracles. <laughs> One time, and then I'm done. I, I was invited to be a part of a youth retreat. And it was a lot of and it, has, who's been on the lock? That's when you stay up with teenagers all night long. <laughs> um, and, and we were, I was in a group, we split up, and so I was with a group of high school guys. And there was a fellow over in the corner who was like, <sighs> you could tell. All of his bad body language was, I just can't stand this. And so I decided, engage. So I don't even remember the man's name. So, but I said something to him, all of a sudden, I'm not even sure this is even true at all. Uh, blah, 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 blah. I said, and so I don't even know how this happens to me. I said, I'll tell you what. If we pray for you, I can promise you that you will know something of the presence of God that you didn't know before. And he was like, okay. <laughs> and so three or four of us gathered around him and we prayed for him. Bam! God just touched him. And he was absolutely, I mean, his eyes were the Because he knew something had happened. It wasn't anything that had been manufactured. And just about that time, somebody else from the youth group, who was one of the leaders, a young lady came over, tapped me on the shoulder, took me into another room, and they were praying, a bunch of girls were praying for one of the members of the youth group who, who 
who had a problem with her elbows, and what happened was is that she had limited mobility. She couldn't extend her arms all the way, and it had been like that for a very, very long time. And would you pray for her? And, you know, sometimes you just kind of get on automatic pilot. It's like, sure, let's do it. And, and so I, I literally picked up her elbows, and we prayed, and I mean, within seconds, her elbows just boom, just like that. Um, it, those things really can happen. And, and they're glorious. They're just absolutely glorious. I have been supernaturally healed on a number of occasions, personally. But it's episodic, remember? That's a word I used earlier. Unpredictable. Because God will always be God. He has plenty of people who know how to do this. He breaks through in ways that absolutely sometimes involve no human being whatsoever. My job and our job is to take my place in the place that God has given me, for me to be available for God to use me within the community to which I've been called for His purposes. For you, for many of you, it's your parishes, it's all saints, it's St. Michael's, it's another church for you're a part of. For God to use you and to, to line up with others who are engaged in this ministry and say, what can I give? What can I give to be a servant? To go through that maturity change so that the focus of your prayers is the well-being of other people. And out of that, see what God does. I promise you, it's worth it. In fact, it's an extraordinary adventure. Let's pray again. Gracious I thank you that it's not just us who are here. You, you are here. You are here. And I'm so grateful that you would deign to come into our midst, broken sinners that we are, worthy of your judgment and not, because you seek peace and forgiveness and mercy. Because you are the one who came to seek and save that which is lost. And so, in response to your presence, Lord, we lay before you, us, as we have prayed, and here we offer and present unto thee, O Lord, ourselves, our souls and bodies, to be a holy and living sacrifice unto thee. Take us as we are, O Lord, imperfect, broken, often rebellious, but at least here, really, and use us as you see it. May we be that sanctuary 